This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of Your Radio Doctor and their guests and do not reflect the opinions of WPHT or Odyssey. Your Radio Doctor does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, products, physicians, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on Your Radio Doctor. Always consult your own physician. Today's program has been pre-recorded. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. Talk Radio 1210. WPHT, WPHT, HD, WOGL, HD3, Philadelphia. From the Cherry Hill Volvo Studios, where relationships matter. It's time for the Delaware Valley's first radio doctor. On call every Saturday afternoon at 5. This is your radio doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. Listen, 7 months or 10 months is an absolutely exceptional, exceptionally short time frame to produce this vaccine. Your health determines your life, your longevity, and your happiness. Let your radio doctor lead the way with your medical education. Your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Good evening and welcome to your radio doctor. I'm your host, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Happy 4th of July weekend, one of my favorite holidays when we celebrate the birth of our nation. This evening, we're also celebrating the first annual World Bronchiectasis Day which took place yesterday on July 1. Bronchiectasis is a lung condition often missed and can cause chronic illness. Finding it and starting treatment as early as possible can make a big difference in a patient's prognosis. Our guests this evening are from the COPD Foundation. We open the show with Dr. Tim Aximet, a specialist in lung disease from the Mayo Clinic. Then we'll hear from Dr. Ruth Talsinger, president and CEO of the COPD Foundation. Dr. Tim Aximet, Associate Professor of Medicine and a consultant in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. He's also the co-chair of World Bronchiectasis Day and a very active member in the COPD Foundation. Tim, welcome. So good to have you tonight. It's great to be with you, Marianne, and especially on a special occasion as uh, this is with uh, the inaugural uh, uh, release of World Bronchiectasis Day. So maybe we should start by explaining to our listeners what bronchiectasis is, and if I may, ask you to explain how it differs from COPD. Marianne, those are really great questions, and uh, I would first start out and say that bronchiectasis is a chronic condition most notable for recurrent infections and inflation, inflammation involving the bronchial tubes rather than the little air sacs themselves. As noted, this is a uh, awareness for World Bronchiectasis Day, and I would just share that bronchiectasis, the scarring or dilation of bronchial tubes with recurrent infection and inflammation, is different depending on where you are globally. Our comments today as we have this discussion really are going to be restricted to our experience here in the U.S. and North America. But if we're in other parts of the world, that may differ exactly how we get to the same spot. In any case, bronchiectasis, as noted, is this dilation and chronic infection and inflammation that involves the bronchial tubes generally leading to chronic respiratory symptoms of cough, sputum production, fatigue, sometimes uh, shortness of breath. Other patients may have bleeding in their sputum, blood uh, hemoptysis, pleuritic chest pain, and even weight loss. And so for our listeners, if we think of the lungs um, maybe as a tree, there's a main bronchus through which our air is inhaled and sent into smaller branches in the tree. And that's what you're talking about. The bronchioles come off the main bronchi. And then the bronchioles feed, as you said, the sacs is where air is exchanged. So we're a step before air exchanging in our internally. And it's those bronchioles there. This damage leaves them a little wider than they should be. So if they're wider, I guess it's almost like having a little pothole, then any um, 
uh, fluid or congestion in our lungs has a place to sort of puddle and stagnate. And it's easier to ca- have pneumonia or get infected, yes? That's exactly right, Marianne. And along with this dilation of the bronchial tubes, we have little hairs called cilia that line those tubes and normally help facilitate and assist us clearing the normal mucus that these bronchial tubes normally produce. I might also add that our airways are not sterile. That is, they're reflective of all the germs that are all around us in our environment, whether they're bacteria, mold fungi, naturally occurring viruses, phages, or mycobacteria. With the mucus that then has a tendency to pool or be retained, it's a great place for these germs to grow that are normally residing there. And if they become a bona fide infection, that leads to more damage, more accumulation, and sets up what's been known historically as a vicious cycle of infection, inflammation, more damage, and around and around. At the end of the day, one of the primary driving factors here is felt to be this retention of mucus that's normally made in the abnormal bronchial tubes. So ordinarily, we're breathing in all kinds of critters in the air that if your cilia, the little hairs that act as, I guess, like a a vacuum cleaner, and mucus, mucus is made, the lining of if our listeners picture the inside of your mouth is lined with mucosa, that shiny surface is the same thing inside our lungs. And when it gets insulted by a virus or a bacterium, it makes mucus. Mucosa makes mucus. And that's sort of the carpet, the the, uh, the magic carpet that helps you sneeze it out or blow your nose or get that bug out of your system. But if your bronchioles are too wide and that puddling occurs, you, you painted a very clear picture for people to understand this. So risk factors, why? I, I know from what you've said, 50% of the time, we don't know what causes it in certain people. But what are some of the more typical uh, causes? Because unfortunately, not knowing the source leads to delay. It's often mislabeled. Tell us about some of the causes. And, and that's an excellent uh, uh, place to start with. And I'm going to, again, preface my comments and give the caveat that I'm really restricting our comments to our experience here in the U.S. and North Mm -hmm. America. And again, that may vary if we were in other parts of the world, where they be in India or South Africa, where there are other causes. In any case, we understand that this bronchiectasis, in most instances, is without an identifiable cause doesn't mean that there's not an identifiable cause. It just means we're not smart enough to figure that out yet. And it's very interesting that the experience in the U.S. in particular is one of individuals at most risk for this to occur are generally women more so than men. Usually, as we get to our fifth, sixth, and second decades of life, not because we've smoked, not because of any choices or exposures to any chemicals or dust or even secondhand smoke, but there seems to be some predisposition to this. And so that's considered idiopathic or we're not smart enough to figure out why that bronchiectasis is there. I might also add that there are other identifiable causes that are less common. So sometimes if we have a bad pneumonia or in the past when we've had tuberculosis, more common in the U.S., we'd see uh, bronchiectasis as a result of that. Individuals who have immune problems either as a child or later in life, which are acquired, can lead to more infections of the bronchial tubes and additional bronchiectasis. This is an unusual cause, but another treatable cause. And I can't uh, uh, pass this by without noting that there are some genetic abnormalities that are not uh, uncommon causes for bronchiectasis, and that is cystic fibrosis and something called primary ciliary dyskinesia. I would share that there's increasing numbers of adults that have been demonstrated to have mutations or genetic abnormalities of cystic fibrosis, even in their mid and later uh, years of life. So it's not just a diagnosis that's made in young individuals early on, although that is the usual or typical type of presentation. 
The other genetic uh, uh, predisposition is this primary ciliary dyskinesia, which means those little hairs that you have spoke of, Marianne, that line our bronchial tubes and help us facilitate that mucus clearance normally, uh, genetically are either affected because their structure or scaffolding is missing a link or a piece, or that they don't work because of how they normally function. There are now testing for these genetic abnormalities such that this is something uh, that represents a very active area of ongoing research, not only here in the U.S., but internationally. That's fascinating. And, and it's so great that uh, the COPD Foundation exists because all that information is focused in one place that people can share with you and you with and you could share with them. So no surprise if a person has had pneumonia or they've been treated for TB, you say, well, that can lead to lung damage. But what a surprise when I learned from you, one of the other um, situations that increases risk is plain old acid reflux. But you figure if somebody's lying in bed at night and they're asleep, and if the fluid comes up high enough and they aspirate, or as we know, inhale some of that fluid, that seems to be a not so uncommon source of bronchiectasis as is sinus infectious. We have a minute to talk about that. Sure. And that's a very common and, and important aspect of care. And outside the lungs, the two areas that can aggravate or even, as you say, Marianne, can actually cause bronchiectasis or are closely associated are active sinus infections and hiatal hernia or reflux disease, which are very common in our general population point here is that as patients are diagnosed with bronchiectasis, we must also pay attention and be mindful whether or not there's reflux or swallowing issues that are either aggravating or contributing to the cause of bronchiectasis, and likewise, if there's sinus infection. If either of those situations are present or both, and they're unattended, it would be very difficult to uh, get control of the bronchiectasis. So in a self-serving way thinking about airways and bronchial tubes, it's always important for me to have that discussion with patients about whether or not there's reflux disease and or sinus disease present. Makes perfect sense. And then you could call your friend, Dr. Ritchie, the GI doctor. Absolutely. <laughs> Invaluable. Yes. Let's take a little break and we'll be right back to talk more about bronchiectasis. Thanks for listening to Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Mary Ann Ritchie, exclusively presented by Independence Blue Cross. If you have a question for the medical mailbag, just send a note to doctor at yourradiodoctor.net. Hi, I'm Dr. Denny Carice, Chief Science Officer at Recovery Centers of America, and I'm here as your addiction expert. So a lot of people ask me, Denny, what is fentanyl? And what are these things called analogs? Is fentanyl heroin? Fentanyl is not heroin, but it's an opioid like heroin and like carfentanyl, the other analogs. So all the opioids, we compare all of them to morphine, the first and organic opioid. Now heroin is about two to five times stronger than morphine and fentanyl can be 50 to 100 times stronger. We have that big range there because it's illicitly manufactured fentanyl, it's not pharmaceutical fentanyl. Now, carfentanyl is another one people hear about. There's only one accepted legitimate use of carfentanyl, and that's in veterinary sciences, and that's to sedate large animals like African elephants. There's no really legitimate use or no reason why that would have any human use whatsoever, because carfentanyl can be up to 10,000 times stronger than morphine. Now let's go on to the analogs. An analog is when you look at this molecular structure of something and you add a little molecule or you move a little molecule over here, but it has the same effect. So if you take fentanyl and you move a little molecule, you now have an analog. Same thing with carfentanyl. The problem with those are that they didn't exist yesterday. So something that didn't exist yesterday that a street chemist makes is not illegal. So what used to happen is that we had to identify it, find it on the street, give it a name, test it, identify the molecular structure, and then push it through the DEA. 
Well, in 2018, the law changed that said anything that has a very similar molecular structure, like fentanyl, carfentanil, that is an analog, is automatically illegal. So that was really helpful, but it does expire October 22nd in this year. So we really need to fight to extend that law to continue out because we don't want people getting fentanyl, carfentanil, or any of the analogs. And by the way, there's about 1,400 identified analogs out there. So the big problem is that when somebody laces heroin or even fentanyl with carfentanil or the other analogs, it's very likely the person will have an overdose death and we don't want that happening to our kids. If you or a loved one has a problem with alcohol or drugs, call 1-888-RECOVERY today or go to recoverycentersofamerica.com. We answer the phone and admit patients 24-7. That number again is 1-888-RECOVERY. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars, Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction. You are not alone. If you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your whole family can begin to recover. At Recovery Centers of America at Devon and Lighthouse, your loved one will be treated with care by expert addiction professionals, while family programming will give you support and healing so that you can recover as well. RCA accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services. Call 1-888-RECOVERY now. When we ask questions, we make sure they're the big ones. Like, how can the healthcare industry earn the trust of patients? And what if your health outcomes and access to care weren't defined by your skin color, sexuality, gender, or zip code? At Genentech, we're removing barriers and partnering across the medical community to make clinical research as diverse as the world we serve to ensure communities have access to healthcare. Learn how we are working to make healthcare more equitable at gene.com slash askbiggerquestions. We're back on your radio doctor with Dr. Tim Axamet, learning so much about bronchiectasis. Tim, we talked about some of the um, underlying conditions that increase risk for this lung damage or dilation or widening of the bronchial uh, tubes in our lungs. We also want to mention that chronic inflammation with other systemic conditions such as scleroderma, some connective tissue diseases, inflammatory bowel disease can sometimes have lung involvement or even patients who have had radiation near or uh, in the chest area can and can have this underlying lung damage or bronchiectasis that sets up for uh, other damage. So um, let's talk about the commonly associated infections because they're common when we converse with each other, but I think they'd be a surprise to our listeners. Marianne, those are, this is a really important point as well. And just to, uh, again, emphasize that our airways are not normally sterile and often reflect those germs that are in our environment. And there are different types of germs. Some are bacteria, some are viruses, some are mold or fungi, and some are mycobacteria or cousins, if you will, of tuberculosis. That is not tuberculosis, but cousins that are in, our, in the environment and soil and water. Specifically, when we see these germs show up in sputum samples or respiratory secretions that are cultured, um, that is oftentimes a cue or a marker or should raise mindfulness whether or not bronchiectasis is there. Specifically, some of the bacteria when we find those are called pseudomonas or staph or haemophilus. Um, the fungi uh, molds when present, aspergillus or another one called cetosporium. These cousins of tuberculosis or non-tuberculous mycobacteria, often referred to as NTM, uh, can involve mycobacterium avium complex, which is the most common of these types of organisms uh, in the world and on, in every country and on every continent of this planet, M. abscessus, and then there's almost 200 different other types of NTM. And the point is that these are nonspecific and much akin to the symptoms that are nonspecific, and oftentimes patients have a delay or a misdiagnosis of other types of lung problems, sometimes asthma, sometimes COPD, 
which is generally felt to be smoking-related lung disease, and it's not responding. If we see these germs show up in sputum samples, that should be a prompt for us in our providers and physicians to think about whether or not bronchiectasis may be present. So I think that's a very important point right there. COPD means that the alveoli, or if we picture again a tree with the main trunk of the tree that branches into smaller branches called bronchioles, and then those bronchioles feed the leaves on the trees, right? The, the, the air sacs where air is exchanged with carbon dioxide is where COPD affects, right? That's correct. Whereas we're talking a step before that the bronchioles become dilated and they they allow puddling of germs, et cetera. So there are two different areas. And that's the biggest difference between bronchiectasis and COPD for our listeners. And you mentioned that, yes, we're inhaling bacteria. And, and if everything is working well, if the cilia are cooperating and the mucus is being uh, created at, at the, the right amount, you don't get pneumonia. But if you have damage from another uh, a previous infection, but this mycobacteria or mycobacterium is the singular, this group of bacteria called mycobacteria, we call them atypical because they're, they grow differently in culture and they look a little different, their morphology or their shape. So they're difficult to identify when we do initial testing sometimes. And then the other thing that makes them atypical is that they need a longer course of therapy. And so I have several patients that have, that have been told they have MAC, mycobacteria um, avium complex. And they're scratching their heads like, what in the world is this? How did I get this? So you mentioned that women, suburban women, suburban white women, it's an interesting category. Can we say anything a little more about mycobacteria? Um, what we understand, and again, much uh, uh, similar to our experience in the U.S. with bronchiectasis, um, this appears to be uh, uh, more a problem for uh, women than men in their uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh decades of life, again, by no fault of theirs. Um, mm -hmm. I would share that this uh, infection, if and when it's present, this mycobacterium, uh, is almost always associated with bronchiectasis. But it's important to realize that bronchiectasis is not necessarily associated with MAC. And in the U.S. experience, maybe about 20 or 30 percent of bronchiectasis patients or women uh, appear to have a mycobacterial infection so that it should be assessed, but not necessarily uh, it's a given. The other part of this is the diagnostic part. So if there is a question about gee, I have symptoms, I've been told I've had this or that, uh, whether it be asthma, COPD, other types of uh, diagnoses, and I'm not getting a response. I have cough, I have sputum, I'm having recurrent infections. A chest CT scan is really the first uh, test that we want to reach out for, looking for a diagnosis to establish whether or not we have these dilated bronchial tubes. Uh, with that is this mucus uh, uh, collection and mucus plugging. And sometimes that's described in the small little bronchioles as tree and bud. It looks like a branch with little buds coming off. Mm -hmm. And my point in a long-winded uh, way, no pun intended for the <laughs> group listening, is that it's not specific for just mycobacteria. It's suggestive of it, but there are lots of different reasons to have this mucus accumulate in the airways with bronchiectasis, not just related to MAC or non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and needs to be fully evaluated to get to the bottom of things. Mm -hmm. One of the other dimensions or aspects, if you will, is that these are all treatable conditions. It is something that I want to really encourage your listeners to understand that with the proper assessment and proper care, um, not only is bronchiectasis manageable and treatable, but these unusual infections, should they arise, are also uh, treatable uh, for patients. And that's the message of hope that you're so good at relaying to listeners and, and at this World Bronchiect Bronchiectasis Day that is now uh, established. It will, this was the inaugural event and it will be annual because people around the world, you say this is relatively common. And I, and I think listeners need to take away another message when this mycobacterium or this group of mycobacteria are, 
are tuberculosis, the genus species is mycobacteria tuberculosis, right? So people say they think, oh my gosh, do I have TB or something related to it? No, they, they happen to be relatives, but branches from a different tree. Again, not, not to use a pun here. Um, so you've not had TB. It doesn't mean you've had TB. It doesn't mean that you'll get TB, but the earlier we find it, the better. And the common expression now is NTM, meaning non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So for our listeners, if they want to look that up, right, would that be a good way to look for this mycobacteria? That would, that would mm -hmm. be exactly the place to start. And um, the program will continue to uh, outline where some of those resources are uh, with the whole notion of World Bronchiectasis Day is for the world to come together globally and really raise awareness because through collaboration, we really will be able to advance the science uh, and start to address the unmet needs that really is a larger burden um, than I think was previously recognized. And again, mm -hmm. I would just emphasize that whether it be bronchiectasis or a mycobacterial infection or other unusual infections, these are all treatable and manageable uh, in the right hands. Um, what I also would just, I, I want to also emphasize is that we've talked a lot about the mucus uh, being retained or pooling within the bronchial tubes that are dilated and damaged. And and so a large effort, and we think that one of the primary drivers to prevent progression of bronchiectasis is something called airway clearance. Mm -hmm. And that really is uh, designed to prevent that pooling or retention of mucus so that that becomes less optimal for germs to grow or cause more infections. There's lots of resources, and this is an important discussion for your listeners to have uh, with their providers and physicians, and even and work with chest physiotherapists on finding ways that we can manage and prevent that pooling of mucus or secretions to minimize risk of infection. Well, so if you find, a, I'm sorry, but if you find an infection, you're going to use antibiotics, uh, but it's so important for people, to, I didn't mean to interrupt you, to uh, know that they're, that mechanically we still have to keep the, the assembly line moving. That's exactly right. And they're not mutually exclusive, Marianne. And so in addition to using antibiotics uh, when indicated, it is also important that as part of a management strategy, even for a maintenance, is for patients to uh, uh, really adhere to a excellent uh, airway clearance program. And then patients often, and your listeners probably have asked themselves, well, what's the best program for me? And that has to be individualized. And what I share with patients is that there's not a one size fits all. The best program is the one that works for you and that you're able to do. Um, that sometimes is a, a, a trial and error. What works for one patient may not work so well for another and vice versa. So sometimes don't be discouraged if you come across something and says, well, this is a great uh, way to try to mobilize the secretions. You try it and it doesn't work. That's okay. And that's not unexpected. But just uh, understand that at the end of the day, uh, having airway clearance, generally starting out with regular aerobic activity, and I encourage patients, keep moving. It doesn't matter what that activity is. Most people walk, ride a bike, uh, do ellipticals, indoors, outdoors, do yoga, do Tai Chi, but keep moving. It's great for you, not only from a lung standpoint, but from a general wellness and a lung health standpoint. It's great for your bone health, cardiovascular stress management, balance strength, and really is an important component of any uh, therapeutic plan. And that's why it's so important to persist if you're not getting better. The other things that you list are deep breathing, uh, cycles of um, and postural dra da drainage, meaning that you're in the right position when you're sleeping or sitting up, saline nebulizers, so many good ways to help you maintain your function and, and really prevent further damage. Dr. Tim Aximet, with all you have going on, it is such a treat to have you today and open the eyes and ears of our listeners because this is here to stay, but as you say, it's manageable and treatable. And the big lesson, if you're not uh, improving because your COPD or asthma is being treated, there could be something else going on. So thank you for being with us today. 
You're very welcome, Marianne, and, and it's just a great pleasure uh, on this really important moment of World Bronchiectasis Day, and I can't encourage the listeners to reach out, advocate for themselves, uh, education, 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 and empowerment really with your advocacy is really going to be the key to success. There's great uh, resources through the COPD Foundation website, the World Bronchiectasis Day, and we're collaborating and sharing at the global level lots of resources to help all involved. COPD.org, COPDfoundation.org. Thanks, Tim. Safe travels. Thanks, Marianne. Today's edition of Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross, can be enjoyed anytime, anywhere, at your convenience. Just download the Odyssey app and search Your Radio Doctor. It's health education on demand. This is Emily Rubin, dietitian at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Philadelphia Group, presenting you with the nutrition tip of the week. So when you think of summertime, it usually makes your stomach growl. There are all these barbecues that include grilled meat, sweet corn, juicy watermelon. You stroll down the the boardwalk and there's the smells of the caramel popcorn, pizza, the waves crashing, and each night ending in, in a dripping ice cream cone. Summer is all about carefree time spent with family and friends, but most of these social settings include very indulgent foods. The downside may be some unexpected weight gain. According to a recent study by the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, children are more likely to actually gain weight during the summer months than even the winter months. So the advice I offer to clients, of course, and patients is to avoid crash diets, especially the beach body goals, and embrace mindful eating to prevent loosening the belt. And again, balance and moderation are key. So here are a few of my tips that we can talk about eating mindfully and healthily from the boardwalk, a place that my family spends on many of the weekends in the summer to the beach, and of course, all those cookouts. So let's first talk about the boardwalk. Talk about all the temptations. Every outlet down the boardwalk has different food samplers offering you pieces of fudge, water ice, and gelato, popcorn, and pastries. You know, recently I decided to taste all these treats with my family. To my surprise, it actually helped satisfy my cravings. So how did this actually satisfy my cravings? I made sure I tried all these foods after I ate a balanced meal. This way I wouldn't go to the boardwalk starving. Another tip is maybe eat a little bit less at dinner to plan for those treats. If you want the gelato or the ice cream, order a small or split one with a friend. You will be surprised that the small size is actually much bigger than you really thought. Some other healthy choices are maybe some adding veggies to your pizza like spinach instead of pepperoni or opting for grilled or baked fish instead of fried and really slow down and savor the flavors of your food. So most importantly, don't forget to walk the boardwalk. You, I bet you can get 10,000 steps in there real quick. This is Emily Rubin presenting you with your nutrition tip of the week. For more information, you can go to yourradiodoctor.com. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars, Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. When you have orthopedic issues, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes orthopedics. You need an exceptionally specialized Rothman Orthopedics physician. They not only specialize in orthopedics, each Rothman physician only focuses on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you can get past pain and be what you were. Schedule conveniently online at RothmanOrtho.com. That's RothmanOrtho.com. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction? You are not alone. If you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your whole family can begin to recover. At Recovery Centers of America at Devon and Lighthouse, your loved one will be treated with care by expert addiction professionals, while family programming will give you support and healing so that you can recover as well. RCA accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services. Call 1-888-RECOVERY. Now, when we ask questions, we make sure they're the big ones. Like when it comes to diseases, can we strive to treat, prevent, and even reverse them? And how can we make healthcare more effective and more affordable? These are the types of questions that can help impact the lives of so many patients. 
that help push the boundaries of innovation and healthcare for all communities. At Genentech, we are the pioneers of the biotech industry, tackling some of the biggest questions in healthcare. Learn more at gene.com slash ask bigger questions. Your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, now Saturday afternoons at 5, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. And welcome back to Your Radio Doctor. Our guest now is Dr. Ruth Tausinger, President and CEO of the COPD Foundation. She is recognized internationally as a healthcare leader, a patient-focused innovator, and a scientist with extensive research experience that has led to new medications for patients. She was at GlaxoSmithKline until 2019, and at has been involved with the foundation for many years, including in the role as chief scientific officer. And she has successfully coordinated public and private partnerships with nonprofit organizations, leading to many programs that connect patients, caregivers, researchers, government agencies, advocacy groups, and industry. What a big job providing input regarding planning and implementation for clinical trials, which means she considers everybody, which is so important. Ultimately, it brings the patient's voice to the center of all the foundation does. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I hope I explained that well, because, you know, a lot of people or uh, providers talk about uh, patient-centric, but you've really mastered it, and I, and I give you a lot of credit for that. So we're talking about bronchiectasis, which is a new vocabulary word for a lot of our listeners. Like many diseases, earlier tonight I was talking to um, Tim, and we we realized with most diseases, the earlier you diagnose it and begin therapy, the better the outcome. But many people don't realize that chronic lung conditions are a leading cause of death and disability in the U.S. and globally, and the COPD Foundation is committed to educating and engaging patients and providers. So if you would, if you could tell us about World Bronchiectasis Day, because I know that's that's your baby. Thank you. So World Bronchiectasis Day was July 1st, was the first ever World Bronchiectasis Day. And it's an internationally recognized day dedicated to bronchiectasis awareness. It was born out of a conversation that I had with my colleague, Delia, at the CFD Foundation in the early fall last year. And at the time, we were discussing planned activities for the next rare disease day. So being naive, I questioned, why don't we have a day dedicated to bronchiectasis? Because it affects hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals worldwide, including children. And very few people know about it. So recognizing the need for global awareness, I suggested and the team at the foundation agreed with me that we could elevate the global conversation about bronchiectasis and take the lead in declaring a World Bronchiectasis Day. Dr. Tim Aksumit that you just spoke to and, and Professor Chalmers from the UK took the lead as co-chairs of the effort. And the three of us contacted all our collaborators from patient advocacy groups and professional societies around the world in Europe, Asia, South Africa, Australia, and the Americas. And while it may seem daunting to some, it really wasn't because, in fact, they were all very enthusiastic about the idea. And uh, many countries like the U.S. experienced an increase in prevalence of bronchiectasis and saw the need for research, education, and advocacy. So everybody jumped on, hopped on, agreed to join World Bronchiectasis Day Organizing Committee and work with us uh, on this first inaugural day uh, on July 1st. And this year's theme is bringing the world together for bronchiectasis, which is really what we've done. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a result of awareness, because you mentioned before is the, the need for early diagnosis. And there's a lot of research, as you said, that, that chronic lung diseases like COPD or bronchiectasis develop well before people actually sometimes have symptoms or get diagnosed. And very often people experience symptoms and tolerate them for many years, or they're treated with a variety of medications that were developed for people with established advanced uh, disease. And if we're really 
going to make a difference and prevent progression or heal the lung, and this is where I like to talk about it, is um, the need to diagnose a disease early enough so we can intervene and help people understand how to take care of their lungs. We always talk about taking care of our hearts, our muscles, our bones. What about the lungs? So sure. the, yeah, <laughs> the sooner the person is diagnosed and can manage their health, the better. But unfortunately, sometimes it takes several years, sometimes more than 10 years of illness before a person is diagnosed with, with conditions like uh, bronchiectasis or, or COPD. And, um, and it's really important that providers put the pieces of the puzzle because sometimes people complain about cough, sometimes about being tired or fatigue or infections that are recurrent. And providers don't always have the time or are not fully aware to, to put all those symptoms together and, uh, and intervene early enough. So you mentioned patient centricity. It's really, it's my personal passion. It's the group's passion to approach lung health research with patients in mind as we really try to bring awareness, prevent lung diseases, and uh, hopefully at some point find cures for those diseases. And uh, in the United States, the COPD Foundation patient community just had a Hill Day, or uh, we call it IMPACT, speaking to legislators and educating them about the need to prioritize funding for lung diseases, because that is one thing that we know is that those are severely underfunded. So speaking of education, we have lots of educational materials available. So after July 1st, not one person hopefully will say, what is bronchiectasis? And I hope that people look at our website, www.worldbronchiectasisday.org, to learn more and look at a number of tools that we've generated about engagement, awareness building, and education for many audiences, including uh, providers, patients, and, and just listeners who want to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, for those who might just be tuning in now, the first half of our show, we talked about a term bronchiectasis. If we picture the lungs for our listeners as a tree. And so the your trachea or the, the little lumpy guy in your neck is the big airway that brings lungs uh, air into your lungs via that the, the trunk of the tree that splits into a left and right bronchus uh, or big branches. And then they uh, branch off into smaller bronchioles. And this condition, bronchiectasis, means those bronchioles should be a certain width, but they become dilated or stretched out. And that opens the door you know, we have mucus and, and all of us inhale who knows what in the air, but we have the right um, equipment in there. We have cilia or the little hairs that line our nose. We have them inside the, the airways and we have mucus to, to cough out or get rid of, you know, keep us from getting infected. If those um, bronchioles are too wide, then mucus and bugs tend to puddle and you can become infected and it sets you up for other issues and, and uh, decreased lung capacity. And so maybe half the time, would you say, Ruth, we don't know what causes this, this lung condition called bronchiac bronchiectasis. It can, be, it can result from infection, pneumonia, or it can be congenital. It can come when you have an inflammatory, systemic inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease, and you're working so hard to educate and then engage. If people understand, they're more likely to be committed to take care of themselves and providers. And so the World Bronchiectasis Day, you're trying to raise global awareness and share knowledge. I love, we have a list of things that yesterday, World Bronchiectasis Day included, um, advanced education for providers, healthcare providers uh, at all levels a Facebook event with patient ambassadors. You're trying to get the voice of patients in there who said, you know, I walked around for 10 years. I was retreated for asthma, or this, but it was more than that. It was this underlying, you know, the faces of bronchiectasis, a video of patients sharing their stories and in all languages. Tell us a little more about that. We have about a minute and a half. 
Yeah, we have a number of, through all our partner organizations, we have uh, a, a lot of infographics that are translated. We will be doing a lot of communications in different languages, certainly in this country. Spanish uh, has been prioritized, but we have Arabic, we, we have uh, Portuguese, and we're working with others to add more translation. So on our website, you will see that there's a lot of content from different countries. And as you say, COPD is different from bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis yes. means enlarged airways. COPD affects the alveoli or the little sacs where our air is exchanged with CO2. But COPD is one of the most underfunded chronic diseases in the U.S., correct? Yes, 176 uh, in NIH funding. And um, actually, COPD and bronchiectasis, a lot of people with COPD have bronchiectasis. So they, re they suffer from repeated infections. These patients are a lot worse off. Uh, but yeah, funding for research is something that we're really trying to raise the patient voice to advocate uh, for patients, their families, and also educate their providers. So yeah, funding. It's incredible work that you do. Let's take Thank a little you. break and we'll be right back with Dr. Ruth Talsinger, president and CEO of the COPD Foundation. Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie is presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. Hi, I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. That's Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some of these Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. And all plans include dental, vision, and hearing benefits with no co-pays for routine exams. Medicare's highest rating, Philly's most popular plan. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. When you have joint pain, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes joints. Someone so focused on their specialty, they've written the book on it, literally. You need an exceptionally specialized physician from Rothman Orthopedics. They not only specialize in orthopedics, each Rothman physician only focuses on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you can get past the pain and be what you were. Schedule conveniently online at rothmanortho.com. Official orthopedic partner of the Eagles, Phillies, and Sixers. Now, your weekly prescription brought to you by Genentech, the science-driven company that pioneered the biotech industry to transform how we treat the world's most complex health problems. And we're back for our final segment, your weekly prescription brought to you by Genentech, the first biotech company in the U.S. Dr. Ruth Talsinger, you are quite the ambassador yourself, CEO and president of the COPD Foundation. Some of the programs we'd like to highlight in a few weeks, I want to mention, we end the show, as you know, with your real champion every week. And I can't wait to share the story about a patient who's now an ambassador for the foundation named John Torrance, who had bronchiectasis for, for years and kept getting different opinions. And finally, it took maybe 10 years to get an answer. Am I right? Yeah. He's written a series of blogs. Yeah. And some of the reach, the, the outreach that you do uh, we have about four minutes. Tell us, if you would, about the home sputum program, and then I'd love to hear about the bronchiectasis toolbox, I think, that you share with the Australians. Sure. So the home sputum program is a COPD foundation collaboration with National Jewish Health uh, and, and INSMED, uh, the company, and also NTMIR, which is NTM Information and Research Organization. NTM is non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, disease. So our aim was to really help patients, especially those living in rural community who have limited access to specialty labs. And that's the way NTM lung disease gets diagnosed. So many, if not all patients have experienced delays and other problems with sputum tests. And we want to help patients get access to sputum testing. So for a limited time, we're inviting physicians to visit home sputum 
www.ntmsputum.org to order free at-home test kits for NTM Sputum collection. Tests will be analyzed by National Jewish Health. This is one of the best labs in the country. Wow. Yes. And yes, and we hope to develop a better way for labs in general to process sputum tests in the future through what we learned during this program. We really encourage patients and providers to consider the opportunity uh, for patients. And again, Home Sputum Collection website is www.homesputum.org. So as you say, people that live in rural communities or even uh, communities that aren't so rural, but they're not aware. NTM, we talked about it on the show, non-tuberculous mycobacterium. Mycobacterium has several hundred species, genus species, right? Um, several different variants that can cause this chronic lung condition that sets you up for other uh, difficulties. And um, if they collect their sputum at home, I su- assume they'd mail it to National Jewish, isn't that, in Colorado? Yes, it's a cute. And yeah. extraordinary lab, and they're going to be more likely to pick up something unusual because that category is, is called atypical bacteria because it's hard to identify sometimes and hard to grow out. Let's hear about the bronchiectasis toolbox that you've learned about with the Australians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we don't have uh, a lot of time to go through this. It's on our website, but essentially it's providing, uh, it's giving people um, tools and information that they can share with their patients and look at the basics that they could put up posters and, and, and leaflets and, and really uh, a lot of educational materials for providers to share with their community. Mm-hmm. And I think if, if your lung tubules, the really smaller ones, are misshapen and that sets you up for infection or there's puddling of, of mucus or congestion, okay. Airway clearance is so important. We're not just aiming to give antibiotics or even steroids to clear up the current infection. We want to keep that traffic flowing and clear and clean all the time. Yes, we want to keep the housekeeping going. Yeah, and we work with a lot of patient advocates who remind people, and that's something John Torrance will be telling you, is take care of your lungs. Do the airway clearance every day. This is not something you could take a holiday from. It's really make sure that that you follow those uh, airway clearance techniques and you can live a good life. And people can read about the importance of regular aerobic activity for all parts of your, your, your mental and physical well-being, deep breathing cycles, pet valves is something you can read about, um, nebulizers and a chest vest, lots of really helpful yes. information. So we're going to lead our listeners to homesputum.org if they can take advantage of sending their sputum to a fantastic lab, National Jewish, worldbronchiectasisday.org. And a good start, if they can't remember that, is copdfoundation.org. Would lead them to either of those. Yes, lots of information there. Dr. Ruth Singer, thank you so much. You are a wealth of information and you're doing beautiful work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And now for your real champion, I call this segment, The Stars and Stripes. Long before people could read, watch television, check the internet, they depended on symbols to express their beliefs or share a message. Hieroglyphics included images of animals and nature. Statues and portraits showed people in particular poses to portray strength or certain emotions. And stained glass windows told stories of saintly role models. This weekend, we celebrate July 4th, the birth of our nation, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Though our place on the world stage hasn't existed as long as other countries, America does shine as the greatest leader of freedom and democracy in the history of mankind. And the U.S. flag is our symbol that tells the incredible story of this experiment. There's a beautiful summary of the history of the flag, along with flag rules and etiquette, in the Farmer's Almanac in an article written by Edward Higgins, and he explains that the American flag was designed to represent the new union of the 13 original states, with 13 stripes resting side by side, symbolizing the struggle for independence from England. The seven red stripes and the six white stripes help us remember the year of our founding, 76. A red stripe appears at the very top and the very bottom. 
Red stands for valor, white signifies purity, and blue represents loyalty. One of the first flags had 13 stars in a circle based on the idea that all colonies were equal. By 1818, after a few changes in design, the U.S. Congress decided to keep the original 13 stripes. The blue field is the Union, and each time a new state is added to the Union, the flag adds a new star, always on the 4th of July. The current 50-star flag has been in use since July 4, 1960, when Hawaii was admitted as the 50th state on August 21, 1959. The flag represents a living country that stands on the freedom and ideals which we hold dear. It should always be treated with respect and reverence. Allowing the flag to be damaged or neglected is a sign of disrespect. Citizens should stand at attention and salute the flag when it's passing in a parade or being hoisted or lowered. It should never be dipped to any person or thing, not be carried flat or horizontally. State and institutional flags can be dipped in honor, but not the American flag. It should never be displayed with the Union down, except as a signal of dire distress, extreme danger to life or property. It should never touch the ground, and it should be never used as wearing apparel, drawn back or in folds. It should always be allowed to fall freely. You should display the flag from sunrise to sunset, but only with proper lighting, and not in inclement weather. The flag may be displayed on any day, but especially national holidays. On Memorial Day, it should be at half-mast until noon, then hoisted to the top of the staff. The flag should always be hoisted briskly and lowered ceremoniously. And when you display the flag horizontally on a wall, the Union should be in the observer's upper left corner. American military uniforms feature the U.S. flag, which is worn facing backward. The rule is that the blue field of stars should always be in the highest position of honor on the uniform. That has always been the right shoulder, with the flag's blue stars facing forward. The idea behind the backward flag on Army uniforms is to make it look as though the flag is flying in the breeze as the person wearing it moves forward, just as the cavalry carried the flag into battle during the Civil War. And when the flag is used to cover a casket, it should be placed so that the Union is at the head and over the left shoulder. The flag should not be lowered into the grave or allowed to touch the ground. No other flag should be flown on a flagpole above the U.S. flag. The U.S. flag should have a position of greatest honor when displayed with other flags or banners of states or societies. And when flags of other nations are displayed together with the U.S. flag during peacetime, they are to be flown on separate staffs of equal height at the same level and equal size. The flag of the United States should also be hoisted first and lowered last. The proper way to dispose of or retire a flag is preferably by burning. This burning should be done ceremoniously with great respect and discretion. Burning the flag in public can be seen as a sign of rebellion and protest. It's customary to collect the ashes of a burnt flag and bury them with honor. The best way to show respect for your old flag is retiring it proudly and hoist a new flag. You're showing respect for the flag by always showing it at its best, clean, with bright colors, waving majestically over our land. We credit author Edward Higgins for his article in the Farmer's Almanac as our source, and we salute you, Old Glory, the Star Spangled Banner, your real champion. Thank you for listening this week and every Saturday at 5 on Talk Radio 1210 WPHT. Listen again to all of our shows on odyssey.com forward slash 1210 WPHT. That's odyssey.com forward slash 1210 WPHT. Tune in next week. Our topic will be an update on treatment of COVID and what you should know about monkeypox with guest Dr. John Zarlo, Chief of Infectious Disease from Jefferson. Happy 4th of July weekend. We hope you enjoy a safe and relaxing weekend with your family and friends. Please remember, the best way to enjoy the holiday, leave the fireworks to the experts. That includes sparklers. Don't let little children light or hold them, and don't you hold them if you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol and never light them indoors. Remember to raise your stars and stripes and we ask God to bless America. This is your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, 
Wishing you a happy, healthy, and safe week with the ones you love. And always remember that your health is your wealth. Thanks for listening to your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. To contact Dr. Marianne and to listen to today's show as well as past shows, visit yourradiodoctor.com. This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of Your Radio Doctor and their guests and do not reflect the opinions of WPHT or Odyssey. Today's program has been pre recorded. Hi, I'm Lisa Thomas Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. That's Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some of these Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. And all plans include dental, vision, and hearing benefits with no co-pays for routine exams. Medicare's highest rating, Philly's most popular plan. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal.